Wow, what a challenge. Every time I do something after lunch, <laughs> I think, this is hopeless. This is just hopeless, keeping these people awake after what they've just experienced. Uh, boy, that meal was fantastic. Enjoyed a lot of the fellowship and visiting with the folks. It's been great to be here at Seymour. I'm going to be uh, making a point of uh, complimenting this church uh, publicly in a lot of places where I go because you've been super hospitable. Uh, your feedback has been very, very positive. I'm thankful for that. And I do promise you that you will be known henceforth by me on Facebook as the most prune-loving church I've ever been at. For those of you who don't know, I had to stop at Kroger's uh, yesterday before last night's session to get more of those individually wrapped prunes. So uh, you're a prune-loving church, and that's something to be proud of. That's something to be really proud of. I found it. <clears throat> what kinds of things in life cause you to feel hopeless? Loss. Loss, okay. Uh, things you can't control. You know, it used to bug me a lot that I wasn't in control of everything. Yeah, I was frustrated. Uh, I was a control freak. Uh, now, I have a new beginning. I'm a recovering control freak. I've been in recovery now for a few years, and you know what got me out of that control freak mentality? Is I got to thinking, as much as I want to be in control of everything, because I think that's going to bring me calmness, if I were in control of everything, when things went south, when a train wreck happened, whose fault would that be? It'd be mine. I don't want to be that person. So I have come to understand and appreciate the need to realize that you can't control everything. Even a marriage, I was talking earlier about how it takes two to tango. Yes, it takes two to get married. It doesn't take two to blow it up. It only takes one. Even your marriage, you can't control. All you can control is you, your thoughts, your choices, but you live in a world where you have ties with other people. And their choices that are foolish or selfish can impact your life greatly. As a matter of fact, they can crush your heart. So not being able to be in control and feeling like if we were in control, things would be better can cause us not just frustration, but can cause us to feel hopeless because I can't change this. How about something else that might cause you to feel hopeless? Okay, losing a job. You know, sometimes the job that we have uh, that we worked hard to get and we finally get, over time, if, if we enjoy that job, if it's a good fit for us, we permit it to become really, to a great extent, our identity. Who are you? I'm a preacher. Well, it's kind of like this statement I read in one book written by a female widow. She said, we are widows, but widows are not what we are. They had experienced the loss of their spouse. Yes, we've experienced the loss of our spouse. But it's a part of our story. It's not our identity. The same thing's true with a person who's been through a divorce. That is a part of their story, but it's not their identity. Uh, aren't you thankful that your health condition is not who you are? A cancer patient, for instance. That's a very troubling life circumstance. A phase of life can be very scary. And you talk about feeling hopeless. When you have a health diagnosis like that, or some maybe neurological disease like ALS, it's scary. It's a heavy burden to bear. And it can get to the point where it can cause you to think that, man, my life is hopeless. You may be a cancer patient, but the cancer patient is not who you are. Aren't you glad you're not what your age is? You know, we'd all like to be younger, right? Those of us who are older, 
at some point in time, we cross over the river and we decide we want to be on the other side of the river, but we can't swim back. Well, be a senior citizen, for instance, when you start getting Medicare and covered by Medicare, in my mind, you're legitimately a senior citizen, but that's not who you are. It's a part of your life story, but it's not who you are. Don't ever let your circumstances define you. Don't ever let your life circumstances cause you to feel as if your life is hopeless. Because if you're a Christian, that is never true. And that's the bottom line of what I want to share with you today. Why do we feel such hopelessness? Well, a lot of times it has to do with our circumstances. Now, I can see that there may be times when there may be physical or mental contributions to our perspective of hopelessness. But the vast majority of times, for the most of us, it has to do with negative circumstances. Whether they be negative circumstances created by our foolishness or our ignorance in making a decision, a choice in our life, or if it's just because we were at the wrong place at the wrong time and something happened, whenever we have these negative circumstances in our life, it can cause us to be in such a drag and on such a downer that we can just feel hopeless. It's our circumstances that often are what prompts it. Now, after you've experienced loss in your life, and that's virtually what all troubles and trials in life are, they all are some form of loss. How about finding hope in loss? For some people, it may seem an impossible task, but it's not impossible. But I'll tell you what, having the hope that we can have in life is very valuable. Why do people buy lottery tickets? What are they hoping for? A cash cow. Yeah, they're looking for riches. They're looking for retirement. They're looking for excess prosperity. Why do people say, I do? Why do people get married? What are they hoping for? Happiness. And the love that is unconditional. An unparalleled love, a love like they've never experienced before. And we have this concept, we have this perspective. We're going to get married and we're going to have a beautiful life. And it can be a beautiful life. But what motivates us a lot of times to do the things we do is because we're hoping for something. Hope has a way of motivating and inspiring us. Why in the world would a cancer patient choose to embrace a series of treatments that's going to cause them to lose weight, lose their hair, puke their guts out, have surgeries? What are they hoping for? They're hoping to live. They want recovery. When people have hope, there's a tremendous motivational value to really go way beyond even the normal if you have the hope. Hope motivates and hope inspires. What if you lose the hope? Then what do you do in regard to your inspiration and your motivation? What do you do? Well, one thing that we need to do as Christians is understand that there's a couple of different kinds of hope, and we need to distinguish between them in our thinking and in our conversation. And I've struggled with this for a good while, for several, several months. I've struggled with this issue of what to call these different kinds of hope. And the only terms I can come up with, and if you can share with me a better one, please, after the session, let me know. The only words I can use to communicate the difference is common and uncommon. There's common hope and there's uncommon hope, both in life and in the Bible. And I want to show you what I mean by that. A common hope is like wishing or desiring. When a person buys the lottery ticket, have you ever flipped, not that you spend a lot of money on lottery tickets, but have you ever read the back side of a lottery ticket? about the statistical possibility of winning, or a number about addiction, okay? 
there is sometimes inexplicable hope. It's, it's a dream. Uh, it's a pipe dream. The statistical possibility is highly, highly unlikely. Well, there are times in life when we have hope and it's just a mere wish or desire. Now, in the Bible, Herod hoped, that's the word in the Bible, he hoped to see a miracle from Jesus. Now, he didn't. He hoped. He wished. He desired. But he didn't experience it. Felix retained the Apostle Paul. He was hoping, that's the word used in the New Testament, he was hoping to get a bribe. Well, and then there's Paul when he wrote to Timothy. Timothy, I'd love to come to you shortly. That's my hope, he said. But he wasn't sure, and he knew that he wasn't in total control. So he says, I really am hoping to visit you shortly, but here's a letter in case I'm not able to make my hope a reality. See, there is a, a common hope that's kind of like a wish or a desire. And that is a very common way that we use that word. And it's okay. It's used that way even in the Bible. Hope is a very valuable thing to have, whether you're talking about common or uncommon. Even the common hope, the wish or desire, has a great motivational, inspirational value. It really does help us move forward in our life. Now, the uncommon hope, and I'll read this for you since it's a little bit uh, small in type. Hope generally. Now, this is the word hope used both in the uncommon and common way. The word hope in the New Testament is found 85 times. In the Gospels, only five times. In the book of Acts, 10 times. In the letters in the New Testament, 70 plus times. Obviously, when God had inspired people writing to Christians and to churches, there was a lot of talk about hope. Now, the uncommon hope that is in the Bible is unique because it's not just about a wish or a desire. What it's about is a confident expectation. There's a difference between a confident expectation and a mere wish or desire. And that's the distinction that we need to make in regard to our life, in regard to our circumstances, and in regard to who we are and our life in the future. What is our hope in? Our hope as Christians is in God. Not in a lottery ticket. Our confident expectation is not in our marriage. It's not in the medical profession. It's not in our job. It's not even in another person of any sort in our life, as precious as those other people might be. Our hope as Christians, our hope as people who exist in the image of God, should always be centered in God. He is the object of our hope. When our hope, our uncommon hope, has the object of God, that causes us to have a confident expectation even when our circumstances from a human perspective can be very, very scary and seem even hopeless. In the Psalms, this is talked about a lot. For instance, Psalm 31, hope in the Lord. The psalmist wrote in the 39th Psalm, my hope is in you. In the 42nd Psalm, hope in God. In the 119th Psalm, you have caused me to hope. And then the challenge for ancient Israel, oh Israel, hope in the Lord. You know, a lot of the problems that Israel had in the Old Testament is they placed hope in their own wisdom and initiative and in their political alliances. And they thought if they would kiss up to Egypt, and they'd have a good, healthy relationship with Egypt, then they'd be protected. God didn't want them, his people, to be putting their hope in regard to their welfare and their future in another nation. He wanted them to hope in him. He had a covenant relationship with them that they really didn't fully appreciate, and they weren't always faithful to, but he was always faithful to. And so he was always through inspired people 
challenging his people in the Old Testament. Hope in me. Don't, help, don't hope in the weather. Don't hope necessarily in one another. Don't hope in another nation. Hope in me. Have a confident expectation because I'm the one that you're in covenant relationship with. I'm the one that can work miracles. I'm the one who can work even a more amazing thing sometimes in my providence. Hope in me was the constant cry in the Old Testament. Now, in Romans chapter 5, there's a passage that refers to hope and was even read this morning prior to the Lord's Supper. I'm going to read the first part of Romans chapter 5. You might want to look at it in your own Bible or on your phone if that's where you have your Bible. But in Romans chapter 5, here's how the chapter starts. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Notice the object of the hope. Our hope is immersed in the glory of God. Verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character. Now notice how he goes from one to the other, to the other, to the other. Now look at the beginning of the list as he begins this list of going from one thing to another. Look at the beginning again. Tribulation. Verse 3 produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. You get to hope at the end of verse 4, but what did that start with? Tribulation. See, the trials of life, the testings that we experience in our life, can become our triumphs. The burdens that sometimes life gives us can actually, by the grace of God, be converted into blessings. Because they can have us become better, stronger, wiser people than we ever were before. I don't like all experiences in life. I would not like to experience a lot of things. But the reality is, the things that I've experienced, and I think probably some of you have a kindred spirit, the things that I've not liked to experience in my life that I have experienced have always, without exception, taught me things. I have a, a sweet friend over in the Dallas, Texas area who has caused me and prompted me often to ask this question. What can I learn from this? What can I learn from this? You know, that's a good question to ask yourself when you're blessed. What can I learn from this blessing? This blessing of this particular opportunity, this blessing of this particular gift that I've been given in my life? Then what about the tragedies? What about the adversities? What about the difficulties? The tribulation that we experience, what can we learn in this experience? What can I learn about myself? What can I learn about others? What am I learning about God? What can I learn to be able to help other people? Life is a learning experience. The tribulations especially, probably more than anything else, are great learning experiences. I was uh, riding in a car with a sweet sister in the Lord who was the wife of an elder in the church where I was preaching in Hartville, Ohio. We were on a one-hour drive from Hartville, Ohio to the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And we were talking about different things, very wise sister in the Lord. And in the course of the conversation, she said this. She said, Dean, you know, I really don't think we grow until we suffer. I was a somewhat young man at the time, and I didn't like that idea. And my response to her at that point was, I hope that's not true. Can't we learn also from the good times and the blessings as well? But I think what she was observing was more like this. When you grow faster, when you learn more, when you're really pressed, when you're really challenged, when you're stretched in your life, 
that's often when you learn the fastest. And sometimes you learn some of your best, most valuable lessons. Whenever my wife was struggling with Parkinson's disease for eight and a half years, if you would have come to me and asked me, Dean, could you rate your patient's level on a scale of 1 to 10? I probably would have said about 8.75. But you know what I learned in caregiving? It wasn't 8.75. It was more like 1.50. I learned a lot about myself caregiving. I learned about my limitations. And I learned a lot of humility. And I also learned a lot of valuable lessons about love, about giving love and about receiving love. But there were times during that caregiving experience that I would separate myself from my wife. I would go to the bathroom, and with tears streaming down my cheeks, I'd pray a three-word prayer because that's all I could pray. That's all I could think to say to my Father in heaven. Lord, help me. That's all I could think to say. It's all I had prepared in my head. Lord, help me. There were times during that caregiving experience I almost snapped. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. But I learned a lot during that time. If the Lord would have come to me and said, hey, how about if I give uh, your wife Parkinson's disease and you be her caregiver so that you can learn a whole bunch? How's that? What do you like about that plan? I would have said, no, thank you, Lord. Just give me some words, and I'll read those. Give me a book, and I'll read some stuff about that subject, and I'll learn. Well, life gifted me a challenge. And from that challenge, I learned a lot about myself. And I learned a lot about how much I need God in my life so that I don't snap when I'm at the end of my rope. In this chapter, in chapter 5 of Romans, after it ends that series of things, one right after the other, building on each other and ending with hope, then verse 5 says, now hope does not disappoint. See, there's a kind of hope that does not disappoint. There are times that we hope for things and we're disappointed. But there's a kind of hope, an uncommon kind of hope, that is founded and directed in God, that is confident expectation. It's not just a mere wish or desire. But it's a confident expectation because of our Father in heaven. So he says in verse 5 of chapter 5, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. There is tremendous value in an uncommon hope that is solely founded in things spiritual and eternal. I'm going to start the lyric, you finish it, let's neither one of us sing it. My hope is built on nothing less than Christ and righteousness. My hope is built on what? Spiritual and eternal things. Not in my health getting better. Not in my marriage getting back together. Not in me being able to recover from a decline in the stock market. My hope is in things eternal and things spiritual. Those are things that cannot be taken away from us, no matter what we experience in our life. Now, the problem with embracing that spirit and that perspective is that thinker and feeler that sometimes runs amok and goes all over the place. Typically, I'm this way. I think I'm pretty typical in this regard. It's probably the only way in which I'm typical or normal is when something bad happens, my mind rushes a thousand different directions, but they're all negative. That's where I jump to first in my thinking. And that's where my feeler goes. It goes to the negative. It just seems so natural for us to be that way. You know, when you've lived a little bit of time and you've experienced one setback after another and you've had many, many blessings, but you are so frustrated sometimes with all the 
struggles, it can get to the point where your mind can just constantly be jumping in all kinds of different directions, but all kinds of different directions are always negative, and you kind of have to reel yourself back in and think, now is that true? You know, where I've let my mind go? It can be a real struggle controlling your thinker and your feeler. Indeed, hope is simply faith directed to the future. That's a comment or an observation that came out of the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Faith. Faith isn't just about the present. Faith is also about the future. Hope is about the future. And what hope is, it's really faith in regard to the future. But what is that hope founded on? The uncommon hope. Now, we can have common hope, but we need to realize that common hope is not secure. It's common. It's a wish or a desire. And it's okay to have wishes and desires that are healthy and good, and we need to be motivated and inspired by those good things. But at the same time, there's only the spiritual and eternal. There's only God. There's only the Lord that can give us an uncommon hope that is independent of any negative circumstance that we experience in this life. In 1 Peter, the book is written to uh, Christians who are struggling. And these Christians who are struggling, don't you dare go to sleep on me. <laughs> and these Christians who are struggling, there's a lot of writing in 1 Peter about suffering, about the reality of their suffering, and about how they need to focus on the right thing to get them through this suffering. Now, I want you to notice some passages here in 1 Peter. He talks about them having a living hope. Now, these are people who are going through a very difficult time. If you read 1 Peter, it's only five chapters, and you circle every time there's a form of the word suffer, you'll be impressed. There's a lot of discussion in there about suffering. He reminds them that they have a living hope. Not just a wish or desire, a living hope. He mentions in chapter 1 later on, your faith and hope are in God. They were suffering persecution. They weren't just suffering tribulation because they lived in a broken world. They made a choice to serve Jesus, and as a result of that good choice, they suffered because they made the good choice to become a child of God. That'd be hard to take. And so he reminds them, the hope that is in you is a hope that you have that's spiritual, that's eternal, that's living. Persecution and hatred is what they were experiencing. They were experiencing loss. And they were suffering. They were grieving. Grieving because their life was not what they wanted it to be. I'm most impressed, I think, in that book, in that letter in 1 Peter, most impressed with a section here that I want to note for you in chapter 1. He says in verse 6 of chapter 1, in this you greatly rejoice. Now here they were suffering. They were being persecuted. They were being hated. They were suffering all kinds of loss in their lives. But he says, in this you can greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Now did you notice two extreme emotions there? Opposite emotions. We consider them opposite emotions. He says, joy and grief. He says, greatly rejoice, yet they were also grieving. You can rejoice and grieve simultaneously. What are you grieving about? Your circumstances. What can you rejoice about? Your spiritual blessings that cannot be touched by anything you experience in this world. See, we have a hope that causes us to be able to live above the fray, live above the circumstances. Now, in this particular passage, in verse 6, it starts out, in this you greatly rejoice. What's the in this? Well, in that passage, up there in verse 3, he references abundant mercy. In verse 3, a living hope. In verse 4, an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. He talks about 
the providential care of God, being kept by the power of God, and he talks about our salvation ready to be revealed at the last time, and he says, in this you greatly rejoice. In all those spiritual blessings, you can greatly rejoice even though you're agonizing and grieving because of all of the loss and the collateral damage that you're experiencing because of all the upheaval in your culture. We can be that way in our century as well. We can live above the fray. We can have a hope that flies above the fray. And that's what Peter is writing about in 1 Peter, all those five chapters. A warranty is only as good as the people who back it. My suspicion is, in a group this large, there probably is somebody who's had a problem with having a warranty, but then it wasn't guaranteed. You know, guaranteed for life, that's for however long the refrigerator works. When it dies, it's not guaranteed anymore. A warranty is only as good as the people who back it. Hope that we have is in God. You got a better backer than that? A company will fail you. People may fail you. Groups may fail you. But when you have an uncommon hope in God and in your spiritual blessings, it's a great source of encouragement. It'll lift you out of that hopeless pit feeling that you have. And the reason why is God is the one who's backing the hope. That's your security. God is faithful. He always is. You know what, why I think there's one reason why we have a hard time with that concept of God being faithful? Because we see unfaithfulness. In our culture, we see unfaithfulness. We see workers who are not faithful to their jobs and responsibilities at the workplace. We see people in our personal lives who are friends. Maybe you've been stabbed in the back. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe somebody has sinned against you. You would have never dreamed or expected them to have done that. They're not a faithful friend. Not everybody is a faithful friend. We can have spouses. We've committed our whole life to them, 100%. And they cheat on you. They rip you off. They steal from you a kind of hope, a common hope, that you have in regard to your marriage. People are not always faithful. God is never unfaithful. So you see this uncommon hope that we have directed and founded in God that's eternal and spiritual in nature is absolutely guaranteed. That's why it's a confident expectation and not just a wish or desire. Probably some of you can sing the melody. The Lord, every time I read this verse, that melody pops up in my head. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. You know, great is your faithfulness. Therefore, I hope in him. The reason why it's wise to hope in God is because he's always faithful, always dependable. What he has said in his book, you can take it to the bank that doesn't fail. Today, we know of banks that fail. The heavenly bank does not fail. That's why we need to be laying up our treasures in heaven. Trust God, especially when that trust is challenged. Let's be honest. It's not always being, being human in a troubled world is not always easy. Let me read to you some lyrics of a song from a group called Casting Crowns. I'll bet some of you have heard some of their music. I needed the light to read the lyrics. I'll be honest. I was sure by now, God, you would have reached down and wiped our tears away. Stepped in and saved the day once again. I say amen, and it's still raining. But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear your whisper through the rain. I am with you. And as your mercy falls, I will raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this storm. I will lift my hands for you are who you are, no matter where 
I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I'll praise you in this storm. I remember when I stumbled in the wind. You heard my cry. You raised me up again. And my strength is almost gone. How can I carry on if I can't find you? But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear your whisper through the rain. I am with you. And your mercy falls. I'll raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this storm. I'll lift up my hands for you are who you are no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. Sometimes it's hard. It's hard not just to survive. It's hard to keep praising the Lord. It's hard to be faithful because we're human. One last thing I'll mention as we close. Please be patient with yourself. When you're going through a difficult time in your life, please be patient with yourself. None of us are like a Marvel character. We're not super. We're just Christians. And the problem with being a Christian is you still have to be human. And there's the struggle. The human struggle, trying to be a Christian in a fallen world, trying to keep our faith, keep praising the Lord no matter what in our life, but it's very hard sometimes. Keep reminding yourself, no matter how you feel, even when you feel hopeless, you are never, as a Christian, in a hopeless time in your life. Never. You may feel that way, but that is not the truth. Your feeler does not always communicate truth. As a matter of fact, it lies. And it can be problematic to you in your Christian walk. Live your life in hope, invested in God, no matter what you're experiencing in your life. I'd like for us to close with a prayer. Let's do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings that we enjoy that are innumerable. The blessings that we have that we couldn't possibly count if we wanted to and blessings we do not deserve. We are far more blessed than we are burdened. But sometimes, Father, frankly, it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes we suffer so many losses of different kinds and have different phases in our life where we just become spiritually tapped out. Father, forgive us. Please tolerate our weaknesses and forgive our sins as we struggle with our thinker and our feeler as human beings in a fallen world where sometimes things simply don't make sense and we don't always feel right. Father, bless each and every family represented here with the wisdom they need to navigate the life here that they're living together in this fallen world. Give them, Father, the courage to keep putting one foot in front of the other no matter what. And Father, we pray that you would bless those who are individually or as families who are struggling with losses that they're experiencing in their life. Whether it's the loss of their finances, the loss of their innocence, the loss of friends, or the loss of the peace and tranquility and the, and the goodness of their family. We pray, Father, for those who are struggling with their losses. Bless them, comfort them, Father, as only you can. Help us to be open to the idea of us assisting others, no matter how intimidated we might be by their circumstances. Father, help us not to be idolaters and to cause our comfort zone or our privacy to be our God. Help us, Father, to cultivate a fellowship that is more transparent, more personable, and more open to loving one another and supporting one another, no matter what the ugliness of our circumstances might be. Thank you for this good church. We pray that maybe a few people have been helped during the workshop, and we pray that this church will continue to do a great job of praising you by serving others. Father, thank you for our hope. It cannot be stolen from us by the circumstances of this life, nor our personal feelings. Thank you for our confident expectation. It's in the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. 
And the church said, Amen. Thank you very, very much for your hospitality. Yeah. Uh, I heard there's still more individually wrapped prunes back there. This is your last chance. I'm taking the leftovers to Goshen, Indiana. That's the direction I'm heading in just a half an hour or so. Yeah, half prunes will travel. Yeah.